Okay, 16-2, we're going to talk about uh, another important compromise. Again, you're going to see that uh, um, slavery has is, is just been a series of compromises, and it's going to continue that way. I, I always tell my students that, it, it, you know, the nation at the time kind of reminds me of a juggler, all right? You know, he's juggling three balls, and then a fourth ball is thrown in. It might be a new land acquisition, or it might be, um, so here comes a ball. It might be an, a state wants to come into the union. Here comes another ball. Um, this state wants to come in as a slave state. This state wants to come in as a free state. Um, this state wants to decide for themselves. Other people want to uh, extend the Missouri Compromise Line. And all these, and this poor juggler is trying to keep all these balls. Eventually, they're going to fall. You know, he's not going to be able to keep up. And you can see today's lesson, you're going to see another compromise trying to keep our nation from falling. Or as we said in the last lesson, try to hang on to the wolf. All right? So we're going to really concentrate on the Compromise of 1850. All right, here we go. You remember from previous lessons that, uh, you know, after the Mexican uh, War with Mexico is over in 1848, we find gold in 1848. In 1849, you know, 80,000 people are rushing to California. Uh, there's a lot of lawlessness, um, a lot of vigilantes going on there. And California asked to be admitted into the Union as a free state. Boom, right? But by 1848, there are 15 free states and there are 15 slave states, right? If we add California, what are we going to do? There's not, I mean, it wants to come in as a free state, all right? If we allow California to come in, it's going to upset the balance of power in favor of the North. They're going to have two more senators, you know, in the Senate. And uh, it's going to, again, upset the balance that we have been trying to maintain. All right? Now, the South is very upset about this. They do not want California admitted as a free state. They also feared that other uh, parts of the Mexican session, the Oregon country, were going to come in as free states. Oregon really looks close, and they're certainly going to come in as a free state. But what about Utah? Remember, all those Mormons are out there. Um, even New Mexico is talking about, thinking about applying, and they're talking about coming as a free state as well. So the South is very, very worried. And for the first time, the South feels that they're going to be outvoted in Congress and in the Senate. They know that um, because of this balance shifting so dramatically in favor of the North, that their way of life is threatened. And for the first time, they start talking about secession, which means leaving the Union. All right, so <coughs> you start to see this. Remember, I told you, getting this territory from Mexico is going to have some really um, unintended consequences. Now, because uh, the South is talking about secession for the first time, many Americans are panicked. Oh, my gosh, it's going to rip the country apart. This can't happen. What are we going to do? Who could help us? So once again, they turn to the great compromiser, Henry Clay. Remember Henry Clay of Kentucky? Oh my gosh, Henry Clay is really uh, a key player. In fact, we've talked more about Henry Clay, you know, as a sectional leader, as a war hawk, as a presidential candidate, as Secretary of State, and as someone who really, really does try to keep the nation together. So Henry Clay pleads for the North and South to reach an agreement. And he warns them, if we can't reach an agreement, then our nation is going to break apart. But you remember his, uh, his nemesis, his old you know, buddy, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. All right, John C. Calhoun at this time is very ill. He has tuberculosis. Um, he's uh, too ill to speak. But John C. Calhoun is still a man to be reckoned with. And he refuses to compromise. Refuses. He insisted that slavery be allowed in the Western territories. There's no compromise, he says. Slavery should be allowed to spread. And, as we said in the previous lesson, he demands that runaway slaves be returned to the owners as lost property. Again, he's going to use like an argument, uh, like if your dog runs away. If your dog runs away and runs to your neighbor's yard, you know, and your neighbor holds on to him. You're like, hey, that's my property. I want my dog back. Well, this is what the South sees. They don't see slaves as human beings, really. They don't see them 
as equal. They seem as property. And they seem almost like animals. And since I want my property back and you have them, you're stealing from me. And he says that if the North does not agree, does not agree to the demands of the South, the South would be uh, would use force to leave the Union. He goes on to say that uh, if the North rejected the South demands, uh, he said, let the states agree to part in peace. And if you're unwilling to do that, then we will know what to do. What does that mean? Then we will use force to leave, okay? Now, this is uh, very dangerous, very dangerous. By the way, you might be wondering what this upside down thing here is. This got messed up in my transition from uh, my keynote to my explain everything. That should say the argument, and it was running up and down the side of the screen there. So I apologize for that. Okay, let's look at our last guy. Now, all three of these guys, Henry Clay, John C. Calhoun, and Daniel Webster, had all been sectional leaders. Remember we talked about sectionalism? All right, Daniel Webster from Massachusetts. He feels that slavery is wrong. It's evil. He knows that. But he says the breakup of the United States would be even worse. He warns against a civil war. And a civil war, again, is a war uh, within your own country. And he thought, and he knew, he's a prophet And when it comes to this. If we don't work out another compromise, then it is going to end in the civil war. And guess what he does? He thought that the North should agree to force those runaway slaves back to their owners. Boom. All right? Now, this is a guy, uh, you know, he says slavery is evil. But to preserve the Union, he says that we should take these poor people who have finally run away from their masters, able to get to the North and force them back. Wow. Wow. Uh, that's a tough one. I just, I don't, you know. But again, from his point of view, he feels that the Civil War is going to be worse than slavery. Um, I don't know about that. Now what happens is that uh, Henry Clay is very old. He's 73, 74, something like that. He's frail. He's old. He can no longer campaign for a compromise. So a new guy, his name is Stephen Douglas from Illinois. Stephen Douglas. Remember that name. You're going to hear more about him. He kind of pushes through with Henry Clay's plan. And it's going to be called the Compromise of 1850. And it passes. A lot of things happen, though, in 1850. At first, uh, John C. Calhoun dies. Remember, he has uh, tuberculosis and he passes away. All right? But so did the president. Remember Zachary Taylor, the guy who had been elected in 1848? He dies. Oh, my gosh. All right, so the new president is Millard Fillmore. Millard Fillmore supports Henry Clay's compromise plan. The president of the United States supports this plan. All right, so here are the five parts, and you need to know these. Okay, first part. Yes, we're going to admit California as a free state. Okay, so California is in. Number two, we're going to divide the territory, or the rest of the Mexican session, I should say, they're going to take the rest of that, and they are going to divide it into two territories called New Mexico and Utah. And we're going to let those two sections decide by popular sovereignty. You get to decide New Mexico. You get to decide Utah if you want slavery or not. Okay? Number three. It's going to ban the slave trade in Washington, D.C. Isn't it surprising to you guys? that slavery was still allowed in our nation's capital up until 1850. Because remember, technically, Washington, D.C. is in the south. It's south of the Mason-Dixon line, all right? And slavery is happening in our nation's capital. So the Compromise of 1870, or 1850, I'm sorry, banned the slave trade in Washington, D.C. Thank you very much. That seems like a good idea. All right. Let's get the last one over here. It does settle a dispute between Texas and New Mexico. There's kind of a border dispute. Where does Texas border actually end? Where does New Mexico begin? So it kind of settles that dispute. But let's talk a bit about the big one. It includes the Fugitive Slave Act. And what the Fugitive Slave Act is, is all Northerners must, must, 
help return runaway slaves. You must do it. If you don't do it, you're going to be fined. You're going to be put in prison. And now the Northerners are like, how dare you make a law making me take part of the slave trade? I'm not going to, oh my God, I'm not going to do this. You know, <coughs> maybe, you know, you might be an abolitionist or you might think slavery is evil. And now you're required, if you see a runaway slave and you know where he's at, you're required by law to send that person back into slavery. That is a tough one for them to, to swallow for sure. Okay, so let's look at this map after the Compromise of 1850. Okay, remember here was the old Missouri Compromise line right here. Boom, right there. But remember, it ended right there because that was the Louisiana Purchase. Remember, right through here. Okay. California is now going to be a uh, free state. Okay, it's in. All these other states in green are free. You know darn good and well that Minnesota is going to go in as a free state. You know that Oregon country is going to go in as a free state. Utah and New Mexico are going to have popular sovereignty, okay? This area right here, the Central Plains, which they call the unorganized territory, present-day Nebraska, and Kansas, though. Mm, we'll have to look at that in just a little bit. Is that going to be slavery or free? What about this area right here? Okay? Remember, right here is slaves in Missouri. Hmm, keep that one in in your mind, okay? Okay, now let's look a little bit closer into the Fugitive Slave Act. Okay, so all citizens, all citizens must help catch runaway slaves. All citizens must help. People who let a fugitive escape could be fined a thousand dollars and jailed. A thousand dollars? Guys, that's more than most people made in a year. All right? So that is a serious amount of money, okay? But here's how these, uh, it worked, okay? They actually had special courts. There's no jury trial. There's no jury that gets to decide if this man is a runaway slave or not. It's up to the special judges. And now get this. This is how screwed up this is. A judge who sends a, an African-American back into slavery gets $10, okay? Okay? If he lets him go, says, no, this man is not a runaway slave. He's a freed man or he, he, you know, whatever. He's only going to get $5. So what do you think most of these judges are going to do? They're going to take the money. There are many cases where um, um, judges sent African Americans to the South, whether or not they're runaways. Some of them may have misplaced papers or maybe... Uh, or maybe they said that they're forgeries. Who knows what they said. But many poor African Americans who were not even runaways, who had never been to the South, who had never been a slave, but because of the color of their skin, are sent into slavery from this Fugitive Slave Act. Okay? This outrages, I mean outrages, the anti-slavery Northerners. They made them feel part of the slave system. Remember, many of these abolitionists and these uh, anti-slavery people have been speaking out against this. And remember, the Second Great Awakening is starting to spread this idea that slavery is a sin. So now, you are making me sin. Okay? Uh, tensions remained high because neither side got what they really wanted. Remember, the South had demanded that, that uh, slavery be allowed to expand into the territories. And they really fear that popular sovereignty is probably going to go with the, with the you know, free states. And the South... Or the North doesn't like it because of the Fugitive Slave Act. So nobody's happy. Nobody is satisfied. The Compromise of 1850 really does very little to solve this problem. Okay, so let's talk about one of the most important novels ever written in American history. Okay, Harriet Beecher Stowe, she is a woman from uh, New England. She writes a novel called Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uncle Tom's Cabin. And it's going to show the evils of slavery uh, and part of the, you know, the injustices of the Fugitive Slave Act. Remember, you have to send those slaves back to the South, okay? And it's a, if you guys download this book, it is free. If you have an e-reader, if you have an iPad or iPhone or any kind of a, a 
electronic re reader. You can download this book for free, and I really encourage you to read it. Okay, it's a really good book. Um, for the first time, people actually start reading a story. Now, remember, guys, this is this is fiction. You know, this isn't a actual account of actual people. She kind of takes stories she's here and she builds a story about Uncle Tom. Now, Uncle Tom had been born in Kentucky. He is sold because his uh, master, who is very uh, a very kind slave owner, but he runs in financial debt. He ends up ha ends up having to sell Uncle Tom. Uncle Tom is kind of bounced around to a couple different locations, so finally falls into the hands of a really evil dude named Simon Legree, all right, who ends up basically killing Uncle Tom, whips him to death, because Uncle Tom won't give up the information about two runaway girls. All right, I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but this thing is a powerful story. Uh, Queen Victoria of England actually reads this book. It brings her to tears, uh, it is said. People from all over the north are reading this and like, how can this institution continue? It is pure evil. And there's no way that we can condone this. And the government must, must end slavery. All right? So the northerners can no longer view slavery as a political problem. Um, they said it is an evil sin. And more and more northerners now saw slavery as something that must be abolished. Okay? By the way, Uncle Tom's Cabin is going to outsell every book besides the Bible all the way up through the Civil War. All right? So it's very, very powerful. All right? Now, what do Southerners think about this? They say, this is a bunch of baloney. That's not how slavery is. In fact, actually, Harriet Beecher Stowe actually had hardly any experience with slaves. I mean, she I don't even know if she'd even traveled to the South. So they said, this is a bunch of baloney. There's many people that wrote anti-Uncle Tom books in support of slavery. Um, said did not give a true picture. It's just trying to uh, give false information to play on people's emotions and try to get the North to end slavery. But this book does so much to really move the Northern attitude towards anti-slavery. It's a very, very important book in American history. I kind of even look at it as... Uh, as the prelude of you know the righteousness of the Civil War, that we are doing the right thing. I kind of look at also another book, To Kill a Mockingbird, written in 1960. You know, uh, you see it's kind of the uh, the uh, the plight of the African American in the Deep South in the 1930s, because that's when the time frame this this book was was written it was written in 1960, and really starts to change uh, America's view of uh, of segregation and prejudice against African Americans in the South. And remember, that book was written in 1960, and then in the 1960, middle 1960s, you start to see the civil rights movement really take hold, and many white people begin to support that. So I kind of equate uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin uh, with, with To Kill a Mockingbird. I don't know if I'm right, but that's what I think. All right? So there you have it. That is the Compromise of 1850. It's five parts. California is going to come in as a free state. Um, it's going to divide the rest of the territory into two parts, New Mexico and Utah. It's going to allow for popular sovereignty in those two areas. It's going to ban the slave trade in Washington, D.C., which is good. It's going to settle a border dispute between Texas and New Mexico. But finally, the most uh, uh, controversial part of this is the Fugitive Slave Act. All right? So there you have it. Uh, we'll see what happens next.